Well, uh, I'm excited to talk to you guys about uh, Acts 27. It's, um, it's just neat that we've been able to go through the whole uh, book almost already, and, uh, you know, I'm going to miss it. <laughs> I've enjoyed the story, and it, it's changed me, and I, I'm kind of excited to talk to you on that Acts 29 Sunday about, about what it's meant to me and, and uh, what it's meant to you. So if we could just pray before we get started. I just want, I want the Lord to be present here. And God, Father in heaven, um, you are holy, holy, holy. And uh, we come to you in reverence and humility, Lord. We ask, no is already here. We felt your presence, Lord, during the worship part of the service. You've told us that where two or more are gathered in your name, and we are gathered in your name today, Lord, you'll be present. And so... We invite you to speak to our hearts, to open our minds. Lord, I pray that every word that I speak, it's not what's going to be heard, but it will be your words that are spoken, that your scripture will speak out loud. God, that the message that you have for each of us, and that, you know, we know that each of us is in it, that maybe some of us had a good week and maybe some of us had a bad week, but in this moment, Lord, we ask that you would speak and uh, drop in our hearts what you want us to hear. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. All right, so um, chapter 27, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read all of it, parts of it all I'll summarize because uh, some of it reads like a travel log by Luke, and, which is really neat because historians have been able to go back and, and actually piece together the ports and places that they went and how they traveled and how they sailed. And this is the story of Paul going to Rome. And, and so I, I, I stick with me and, uh, you know, I, I, I really pray that... Um, God will, will show you something special today. So, so Paul very much wants to go to Rome. If you go to Romans uh, chapter 1, I'm not going to read it, but in, in chapter 1, Paul had really wanted to go to Rome. He tells the Romans in a letter before he ever gets on this, this boat to Rome, he tells them, I had planned to come to see you. And uh, for some reason, he's been thwarted in those plans, and he really wants to see them, but he can't. I, I'm not totally sure why that is. The text doesn't explain it. I know that Jerry and I, we recently got to go to Rome, and, and we had planned to go to Rome years ago, uh, like three years ago. It was supposed to be our 35th wedding anniversary trip. It turned out to be about our 38th wedding anniversary trip because of something called COVID and lockdowns and vaccination requirements and masking requirements and who wants to go to Italy wearing a mask the whole time. And so our trip was postponed, and we have access to internet and weather reports and all that kind of stuff, and I don't know what it was like in Paul's day. I don't think they can see what was going on in advance, and travel then was dangerous. Our trip, it wasn't dangerous, you know. It might have been inconvenient at times, but, um, you know, it, it was such a different thing back then, and, and Paul is going to Rome in a way that's different than I think what he had probably planned when he wrote to the Romans saying, I really plan to come see you. Um, I'm going to Psalm uh, 37. Jack and I were talking about, you know, what I was going to be uh, addressing here, and, and um, he said, well, that's interesting, Gary, because I had a devotion today, and it's just right on point, and he had a couple uh, different s scriptures I thought fit, and Psalm 37, verse 23 says this, a person's steps are established by the Lord, and he takes pleasure in his way. Though he falls, he will not be overwhelmed, because the Lord supports him with his hand. And then Proverbs 16, 9 says this, a person's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps. So Paul had planned to go to Rome. I think he thought he was going to buy a ticket and get on a ship and sail under his own steam, but he's going as a prisoner. That's probably not what he had in mind. Paul had wanted to go to Rome, uh, I think, to encourage the, the Roman Christians there, but you know, everywhere he goes, he wants to go to the synagogue and try and persuade the Jews of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then, you know, he's a, he's a, a Roman, right? It'd be like us Americans wanting to go to, you know, Washington, D.C. or New York City. There's a lot of reasons for him to want to go to Rome. But you probably heard the phrase that all roads lead to Rome. Okay, like, I think not all of that was true. Like, not every road led to Rome, but a lot of roads led to Rome. And that means a lot of roads lead out of Rome. And I think Paul strategically understood that if he could get the gospel solidified in Rome and build the church there, that it would spread everywhere. And he had been going all around the Mediterranean. The book of Acts, we see that, where he's been going all around the Mediterranean, sailing to and traveling to these different cities, planting churches, encouraging Christians, and, and getting the word established and spreading the gospel. And so he wants to do that in Rome as well. 
because Rome is the center. It's, the, it's kind of the center of the universe as far as they understood it. Rome was the biggest empire on earth at the time, and here's the biggest city. Um, it's, I mean, even now it's impressive. Jerry and I, you know, we saw things like the Colosseum and the Forum, and you're like, wow, that would be hard to make even today, and that was thousands of years ago. So Paul's not going to get to go the way he wanted. Jack talked about this in Acts 26, um, the trial. And, and, and you back up and you go like, man, Paul has been through a lot of trials. He, he's tried before the Sanhedrin. He's then tried before Felix, who kind of does nothing. And Paul sits in jail for a couple years. And then there's this trial we talked about last week in front of Festus and uh, the governor, the new governor, and then King Agrippa and Bernice, and so um, it seems like Paul is stuck. Like, nobody's letting him go. They know he's innocent. Um, it even says that they recognize his innocence, and the Jews are clamoring for them to kill Paul, and finally Paul, out of desperation, appeals to Caesar. He's a Roman citizen. It's his right. So he appeals to Caesar, and I think this is one of those instances where you see somebody doing injustice in the name of justice. So you see Festus taking this opportunity. He's the new governor. I think it's for both you know, practical and political reasons. It lets him off the hook. He, he, gets, he gets to send Paul out of town, satisfy the, the Jews, like, hey, he's not my problem anymore. And he doesn't have to deal with the Jews. He doesn't have to deal with Paul. And it kind of clears the slate. And so you see a governor doing something probably for political reasons that's unjust you know, in the name of justice, oh, well, he appealed to Caesar, it's not my problem. So he sends them off, and I, I, I just point that out because sometimes even today we see injustice in the name of justice. When DAs do not prosecute people who are stealing, rioting, looting, assaulting and battering others in the name of social justice, that's not justice. When we see people who are, um, you know, uh, abortion doctors killing the unborn, and walking free, and, and the protesters go to prison. Um, that's not justice. When, when church meetings are now a, a subject of pastors being fined or threatened with jail time for just meeting to worship God, that's not justice. And I don't point those things out to cause controversy, but I point them out because even in our system, it goes back as far as the Old Testament. God is a just God. I don't, I don't say that to... To, to cause you to lose hope, but to give you hope, because our God is a just God. And you'll see that even though Paul was being treated unjustly, God is with him the whole way. And so Paul's Rome's prisoner, but if you read some of his later letters that he writes from Rome, you know what he calls himself? Not, not Rome's prisoner. He calls himself Christ's prisoner. He's totally submitted to God's will. And we sang that song, and I thought that was perfect, because we're totally submitted to Christ, and Paul's totally submitted to Christ, and he's in God's hands, and God is with him. And, and not only that, but God has given him faithful friends to go with them. You'll see that um, Luke, who writes this book, he says we. It's like, he's on the boat. And there's this guy named Aristarchus, and I thought, man, that name sounds familiar. Where was that? And I looked it up, and it's like back in earlier in Acts when uh, they were in Ephesus, if you remember in the, in the story about Ephesus, um, Paul causes a near riot when he speaks in Ephesus. And uh, they grab Aristarchus and Gaius, and, uh, you know, and, and Paul's friends are telling him, you cannot speak here, they will tear you apart. And I, I thought, wow, Aristarchus has been with Paul, Luke has been with Paul in all these cities. And everywhere Paul goes, he does the same thing. Essentially, he, he finds a public place, a synagogue, or he finds a, an amphitheater or some market or somewhere to talk to people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He proclaims it boldly with courage, gives it to them straight, and then, you know, then comes the arrests and floggings and stonings and being chased out of the city. And I'm, I'm seeing this, and I'm like, how many of us, if you had a friend that did that, and you were like, yeah, you go, Paul, you know, and you take a, like, you know, take a step back. Um, and now he says, hey, guys, I'm a prisoner. I'm going to Rome as a prisoner. I'm going to appear before this crazy emperor named Nero. I don't know if you've ever heard about Nero. I'm going to appear before him with an appeal that could cause me to lose my life. You want to come? And you know what's been happening every time, everywhere he goes before. And you might be considered co-conspirators by this crazy Nero. And they go. They go with him. 
And I'm like, wow, that God would give us friends like that and that we would be friends like that. So in Acts uh, 27, verse 1 to 7, I'll just summarize. Paul set sail as a prisoner bound for Italy with other prisoners and his good friends. Luke and Eric Starkus are with him. Paul is treated kindly by the centurion Julius, who um, allows Paul at their first port. It seems like a short trip. The first, the first stop is in Sidon. And so they change ships, and Paul's allowed to get off the ship and, and be cared for by, by his friends. I think he has friends all around the Mediterranean. It sounds like some people took care of him there. But Paul had been in jail for like two years, and he's an older gentleman at that point. And I think, you know, jails were not pleasant places back then. I suspect he's a little, uh, a little in need of some care. And so um, they take care of him, and then they get sailing on another ship. And uh, the sailing was slow going. It was, it was rough. And so here we are at, at uh, verse 8. With still more difficulty, we sailed along the coast and came to a place called Fair Havens, near the city of Lycia. By, mu by now, much time had passed, and the voyage was already dangerous. Since the Day of Atonement was already over, Paul gave his advice and told them, Men, I can see that this voyage is headed toward disaster and heavy loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid attention to the captain, and the owner of the ship, rather than to what Paul said. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided to set sail from there, hoping somehow to reach Phoenix, a harbor on Crete, facing the southwest and northwest, and to winter there. So Paul's going to Rome. Um, not necessarily how he thought it would go, and if you can uh, maybe pop the map up there. Uh, it's, I think it's slide five. So if you see at the, at the beginning, he starts out down in, if you look at, it says Judea, and there's a, a place down there called Caesarea Maritime. So he goes up <coughs> and uh, to Sidon, real short, short, boat, short boat ride. And then um, the long one is, is the, the line that starts at Sidon. And so they're on their way. And uh, you see that little island of Crete out there. And so uh, Paul's already sensing that something's not quite right here, right? And Paul has been sailing many times on his prior missionary trips. I don't think he's a sea captain or a sailor, but I think he's probably talked to them on these other trips, and he probably knows something about traveling by sea at that time, which was kind of dangerous even back then, both for weather and pirates and, you know, all kinds of things. And so he gives his advice, but they're not going to listen to an itinerant preacher who is in chains telling them how to sail their boat, right? And, and so, um, you know, they're going to do what they do and, and take a chance. And that Day of Atonement that's mentioned, that's September, October. So, like, right now here in California, we're approaching, you know, the same time period where the weather changes and things start to shift and the winds blow. And, and I think he, he, he's also a guy that uh, in other letters to other churches, he writes about, the need for continual prayer. And Paul is in constant communion with God. And I, I don't know that he's got a special word from God about this voyage, but I think he's got discernment. And uh, that combination of discernment and life experience, he knows something's wrong with this trip. And he tries to warn him. But I think it's interesting how, as, a, as an analogy to our own lives, you know, when we are committed to Jesus, when we are saved, um, and we're initially uh, changed, we'll experience something in our own lives where we see God sanctifying us, you know, changing us to be more like Jesus, and it causes us to drop bad habits and start to see the, the consequences of sinful decision-making in our, in our prior lives, and as we become more and more like Jesus in that sanctification process, we start to see that the world around us that does things the way that the world does, their sin and their bad decisions have consequences as well, and, and they don't see it. And we can try and warn them. For instance, we can warn them about things like, you know, the truth does matter, and, and pride comes before the fall, and money, and, and, and wealth, and power. Those things don't fill your soul. They might, you know, Stuff might fill your garage, but it doesn't, it's not fulfilling. And drugs, promiscuity, wild living, you know, pleasure for a moment, but they don't lead to ultimate happiness. And, and, 
and so on. But the world doesn't, they're not able to hear that, and they're not able to see that unless God reveals it to them. And here, so you see Paul, he sees something that they don't see. And I think what Paul does in the rest of this story, you'll see, is a, is a model for us as believers. Sometimes, you know, it's easy to get caustic and, and angry with people who won't listen, right? But Paul, and you'll see it demonstrated here, Paul isn't like that. Um, he's, he's correct. We'll see it in, in the, the verses coming up. But he's encouraging instead. He's loving. And uh, although he's passionate about Jesus, he doesn't, he doesn't beat him over the head with it. And so, but he becomes trusted, and you'll see this here coming up. In, in Acts 27, 13 through 19, I'm going to summarize this part. Paul was right. There's a storm coming, and it, it hits. And they end up having to jettison cargo and tackle, and they have to give up landing at that harbor in Phoenix, in Phoenix on the island of Crete. And they use a thing called a drift anchor instead of the sails. I don't know if you know what a drift anchor is. I had to look up all these nautical terms, like what's a skiff, what's a drift anchor? So a drift anchor is a thing that you throw in the water and it catches the current instead of sails that catch the wind. And, and it, it, the modern ones look kind of like a parachute that you throw under the water. And so this pulls them away from Crete and it pulls them away. There's a sandbar apparently in the Mediterranean just, it's an enormous sandbar. It's considered very dangerous. It's documented, you know, way back in ancient literature that this was like a death trap for sailors. So they're afraid of that, and this, this drift anchor pulls them away, but they are now literally out in the middle of the Mediterranean. And uh, they've, thrown, they've thrown a bunch of stuff overboard, and uh, they're on their own. And here, Acts uh, 27, uh, verse 20, for many days neither the sun nor stars appeared, and the severe storm kept raging. Finally, all hope was fading that they would be saved. They're losing hope. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul then stood up among them and said, you men should have followed my advice not to sail from Crete and sustain this damage and loss. Now I urge you to take courage because there will be no loss of any of your lives, but only of the ship. For last night, an angel of the God I belong to and serve stood by me and said, don't be afraid, Paul. It is necessary for you to appear before Caesar. And indeed, God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. So take courage, men, because I believe God that it will be just the way it was told to me. But we have to run aground on some island. So if you go to 7, uh, the, the map again. Um, so if, if you see, if you go outside of Crete, there's a little... Uh, blurb there it says ship caught in storm 14 days I think that's where they are they're just out there in the middle and at this point in time you know Paul is now certain of God's mission I heard some of you chuckle you know it's like it's kind of that I told you so moment I don't think Paul's just needling them with an I told you so moment you see that he's encouraging them he's telling them the story that hey take heart uh, we eat something we're we're gonna be okay everything else will be lost by the way <laughs> um and I, I think what I find interesting, and there are several stories about water, you know, in, throughout the Bible. And uh, one of them is about uh, Jonah. Do you remember Jonah? Um, I, I did a sermon on Jonah once, and Rob's talked about Jonah. Jonah was a disobedient prophet who thought he could flee God and not go to Nineveh and not preach repentance because he hated the Ninevites. And I found it ironic that Jonah thought that he could flee God because God knows where we are. And Paul is kind of the opposite. He's the obedient servant of God who's wanting to go where God wants him to go. And he, he'll even go in chains if he has to. And God is with Paul, and Paul knows it, and he confirms Paul's mission. And a part of this sermon is about God has us all on a mission. He has a purpose for us. Jerry, my wife, my lovely wife, thank you for reading it or saying it, you know, we're real people serving a real God through love and mission. And so Paul is on a mission from God. Uh, don't, don't get the Blues Brothers idea in your head. But he's on a mission, and he knows it, and he has a certainty about it. And God reassures him of it. And I think it gives him great confidence so that he is able to encourage people who have literally lost all hope. We all go through storms. And so when you see what Paul is doing and how Paul is interacting with those around him, 
and the storm. He tries to warn them, and then, you know, they don't listen. And so now here they are in this storm, and they're, they're really desperate. They've lost hope. Paul doesn't needle them, doesn't say, I told you so. He says, hey, you know, we shouldn't have gone, but you did, and, you know, let me encourage you that we're going to be okay. There's a way out of this. And so as Christians, I think that's what we need to do, you know. We're going to be going through our own storms. Um, something that's noticeable here is that another, another example of being in the storm is Jesus, when he walked with his disciples, was on a Sea of Galilee asleep with his disciples in a boat when a storm kicks up. The disciples panic. They wake Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, we're about to you know, go under. And he speaks to the waves and wind and calms the storm. That's not what God promised this time. This time, God is not going to calm the storm. God is going to take Paul and all those with him through the storm. They may lose everything, but God's going to be with them. And so sometimes God will calm the storm for us. Sometimes he's going to walk right through us through the storm. And I think in this particular instance, the bigger miracle here is not that the storm dissipates and they're all great and they sail on. The big miracle here is, and you'll see it coming up, they all survive, and they shouldn't have. After two weeks, and this is uh, kind of picking up at 27, I'm just going to summarize a little bit. After two weeks at night, the sailors, they start sensing, and it's dark, they sense that they might be coming near land. I don't know how they know that, but they're sailors. I guess they, they're very adept to this. And so they start taking soundings, and they can sense that it's, it's getting closer to land. So they're really afraid of running the ground, so they, they drop four anchors. And then picking up at verse 30, some sailors tried to escape from the ship. They had let down the skiff into the sea, pretending that they were going to put out anchors from the bow. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut the ropes, holding the skiff, and let it drop away. When it was about daylight, Paul urged them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have been waiting and going without food, having eaten nothing. So I urge you to take some food, for this is for your survival, since none of you will lose a hair from your head. After he said these things and had taken some bread, he gave thanks to God in the presence of all of them, and he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and took food themselves. In all, there were 276 of us on the ship. That's a big ship. When they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing the grain overboard into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but sighted a bay with a beach. They planned to run the ship ashore if they could after cutting loose the anchors. And by the way, look this up. Some divers found anchors off a bay in Malta that matched the time period. And can't say for sure whether they're Paul's ship or not, but I think, I think it's interesting. They then hoisted the foresail to the wind and headed for the beach, but they struck a sandbar and ran the ship aground. The bow jammed fast and remained immovable while the stern began to break up by the pounding of the waves. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners so that no one could swim away and escape. But the centurion kept them from carrying out their plan because he wanted to save Paul. And so he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to follow on some planks and some debris, uh, on some debris from the ship. In this way, everyone safely reached the shore. 276 people on a shipwreck and none lost. So Paul puts a stop to the sailors trying to escape on their own by stealing the skiff. I mean, in essence, this is, this is cowardice. This is disloyalty. Every man for himself. They're getting off the ship. They don't care about the rest. I think it's an interesting example uh, here that uh, they have to stay together, and they have to rely on God's promise, not on their own designs, to be saved. And I think that's, that's what we're supposed to do as a church. We have to stay united as a church. Our church has been through a number of storms. In case you haven't been here for the last five years, some things have happened over the last few years and, and uh, that we never would have expected, some what I would call storms. And we've been through a lot, but we've stayed together. We've pursued what God has promised, not our own designs. And uh, I think that's the way forward when we go through storms. Do you see the change in the centurion? Any of you, <laughs> what, what, what happened to the centurion? Anyone 
He's listening. He's listening to Paul now. The soldiers, they cut the skiff. They're, they're listening to Paul. Um, the centurion wants, to, wants Paul to survive. And uh, why is that? It, it's because Paul has shown himself to be trustworthy. He's now perceived as a man of God who, who maybe God sends angels to and speaks to. And he turned out to be right about that storm. And, and even when they had disregarded what Paul said, and, and Paul could have really said, okay, that's it. I guess, you know, you're all going to die in this storm. Instead, Paul encourages them. He breaks bread. I thought, what a moment of, of boldness when Paul is breaking bread saying, we're going to be okay. He breaks bread and eats and uh, encourages them to do the same. And instead of ridiculing them for, for disregarding his prior instructions. Does anybody know why the soldiers wanted to kill all the prisoners? Anybody familiar with this? So back then, uh, Roman soldiers put their own lives at risk if they let a prisoner escape. It was a pretty strong incentive to not let prisoners escape. And so uh, what you see here is this centurion is literally putting his own life on the line and the lives of his soldiers on the line by allowing the prisoners to make it to shore. Because if they escaped, they could actually pay for it with their own. And Paul, and, and the only difference is they've sailed with him. They've gotten to know him. They've seen he's trustworthy and that he communes with God and that God speaks to him. It's not clear whether Julius, the centurion, converts, but I'm sure he had the opportunity to hear the gospel. And, th and I'm sure that they watched how he behaved through the storm. Being faithful, even in difficult times, builds trust in those who are watching us. And so when we go through the storms, if we're faithful and we continue to place our trust in Christ and not turn to something else like drugs or alcohol or, or, or you know, complaining or whatever, um, people watch that and they see it, even unbelievers do. You know, I mentioned that Jerry and I, we, uh, we, we had the chance to, to, to go visit Rome. And so we were there in June. And, and we, um, we had the chance on one day to go see the Vatican. And that's the, the headquarters for the Catholic Church. And we got to go to the Vatican and St. Peter's Basilica. If you show the slide of uh, number nine, I think it's St. Peter's Basilica. So um, that's what St. Peter's Basilica looks like, just part of it. It's just, it's ginormous. The ceiling is all gold leaf. It's a fantastic, one of the most spectacular cathedrals in the world. I actually forwarded, you know, some thoughts uh, to the elders uh, for our new building after seeing that. Um, I think they're still considering it. Um, you know, we'll see. But uh, Jerry and I wanted to go see, I, I, you know, maybe something a little more down to earth. And, and we had a couple hours to ourselves. And so we, we kind of wandered around some neighborhoods and, and, uh, we stumbled across, we, we went to a, another smaller church, and it was pretty ornate too, you know, I, I guess that's a thing there. They got a lot of churches, and, and uh, we were on our way to another one, and I don't know if you've ever done this with your, your phone, like you, you have a, you have a, oh, well there it is. So you have your phone, and you know, you got, you got a map, and you're trying to walk, and the little arrow's pointing, and it's like you're, you're going the wrong way, and that happened. So I'm going 180 degrees the wrong way to the next little church that I'd found on TripAdvisor, and and somehow we found ourselves in this empty courtyard. And you got to understand, it was June. It's like post-COVID. And I think there are like tens of thousands of tourists in Rome. Like everywhere we went, thousands or hundreds at every place. This courtyard is empty. And there's this church. And um, I'm like, well, I don't think this is like the picture I saw on, online. And, well, I'll go check the door. So I go and check the door. And some, the door was kind of heavy, and I can't read Italian, and I can't tell if it says stay out, tourista, or if it says come in. And so I kind of timidly, I think, it's, I think it's locked, you know, like, and uh, if it was a tourist place, you'd think there'd be lots of people. And so I came back to Jerry, and we're trying to figure out, like, well, where do we go next? And, and I felt this really strong feeling, like, I think we're supposed to, let me go check the door again. I just felt like I should go back and check the door. So I went and checked, and I gave it a little harder tug, and it opened. And I look inside, and I'm like, there's nobody there. And I'm like, oh, uh, you know, like, I felt like we ought to go in. So we, we went in, and, and everything's in Italian. Most of the touristy places, it's English and Italian. And, and I'm looking around, and it's like, this is a really plain-looking church. They had a few pieces of art that were neat and sculptures and things, but the ceiling wasn't gold leaf. It was just a plain ceiling, and it was a very plain church. And um, it was kind of a relief almost from all this fancy, ornate stuff we'd seen. And... And Jerry's, you know, a little faster. I tend to 
look at everything and she just buzzes up to the front and there's this door open on the front it's kind of to the left uh, of the uh, sanctuary and big big giant door this place was built in 1231 so it's like one of these big giant wooden doors and she's kind of poking her head in. and I'm like hey what are you doing like I, th I feel like we're trespassing already I'm not sure we're supposed to be here and uh, we're not Catholic I don't know if that's a thing or not and so um, she's poking her head in and I'm like what are you doing she's like look you know there's a room I'm like yeah okay um, I poke my head in and there's a guy in there and he's like come in and I'm like oh no he, he's gonna scold us because we're trespassing we're in the wrong place we shouldn't be here you know, and he, we, we go inside, and, and so um, I can't understand what he's saying, uh, and then he goes, let me lock the door. <laughs> and Jerry and I are kind of panicky looking at each other like, oh, no, like, are we trespassing? Is he going to call the police? Are we being abducted? Are we going to be Catholicized? I don't know what's happening. And he goes over, and he literally locks the door, and we're like, okay. And he goes, come on, you know, and but now he's kind of smiling, but there's this hallway that leads down, and I'm thinking, dungeon, right? <laughs> We're going in a dungeon. And so we go in this little narrow hallway, and then he takes a turn left up these old stone steps, and, and he's explaining stuff. He's very little English. It's, it's very broken, kind of hard to understand. But we end up in this little tiny room. And, and if you show number 10, that, that's a church. And then we end up in this room. You can just hold that there. Um, and and our, our little guide is Emmanuel, and, and now I can tell he's friendly. He's excited to show us this little special place. It's not on TripAdvisor or anywhere that I could find, and, and it turns out we're at a church. It's, if I can pronounce it right, it's uh, Chisia de San Francisco Arripa Grande, right? Essentially, it's a church built in honor of St. Francis of Assisi, and I didn't know much about St. Francis of Assisi. I, I looked him up, and Jerry and I listened to an audible uh, uh, story about him, and essentially St. Francis was a man who was a wealthy man's son, a spendthrift. He, he spent his dad's money literally on wine, women, and song. Like, he would, he would take all his friends to the pub, buy them dinner, booze, and he had the young ladies. And, um, you know, he was kind of an embarrassment to his dad, and Eventually, like, to, to try and reclaim his reputation, he, he goes off to war, you know, to, for glory and adventure, and he gets captured as a POW, and he comes back, and he's kind of changed, and then he tries to do it again, but he finds himself drifting instead of giving stuff away of his dad, which his dad didn't like, and he started helping use his dad money to rebuild a church and giving money to the poor, and, and you can see this change in his life where pretty soon it's like he doesn't care about all those worldly things. He becomes a wholly dedicated follower of Christ and to the point where his family wants to disown him. And he says, I'll, I'll do you one better. He says, you can just have my inheritance. I don't want it anymore. And he goes to literally serve the poor with his life. He's the, he's the starter of the Franciscan order. I didn't know any of that and, you know, when we were there. But, but uh, uh, Emmanuel is telling this story about... Uh, this church being where um, that room, like this is where Francis stayed when he was in Rome. And so Emmanuel's telling this story, and it's kind of fascinating. Like, man, how did we end up here? I thought we were in trouble, and it's kind of a neat story. And so it was one of those moments that it felt like God was talking to us about something. And he, he asked us at one point, in, a, in a, I think it's the, the next slide, he, he goes, do you have five more minutes? You know, and, it, and so you see this little ornate altar like St. Francis's pictures in the middle, and there's a couple uh, saints. I can't remember. It was like Celesta and the Virgin Mary. So, like, um, and, and this is a new piece. I think it was, like, from the 1500s, this altar that they built. He was very proud of it. And, and he kind of goes, you got five more minutes. I got a story to tell you. And I'm like, okay, where are we going to go? You lock the door? You know, so. Um, <laughs> but but he, he, if you can show the next slide, I think. Um, so he reaches behind the altar, and he's telling us a story as, as, as we're going, and he, he turns the crank. If you go to the next slide, um, and you see uh, all these little silver boxes appear, and he's telling us this story about how um, Francis wanted the Pope to approve of his ministry because at that time, the, the church was doing all this really powerful, wealthy kind of stuff, like building these spectacular cathedrals, and here he is doing this ministry where he not only serves the poor, he chose to go live with the poor. Like that was his ministry. And it was almost the opposite of what the rest of the church was doing, displaying its wealth and power. 
because at that time the church, and it's kind of odd to us, but the church was also the government. They actually had armies, so I, you know, it's, I think it, we're better off without that. But um, So he's doing something very different. He wants the Pope's approval. He goes to him, and the Pope just doesn't answer him. And it's reported that the Pope has this dream and that there's this little man helping the church in a big way, and the Pope calls him back and gives his blessing. And he, uh, Emmanuel was very proud of this. You know, he turns this little crank, and it's almost like a neat, you know, you think in the 1500s, this must have been like, you know, big-time theater or something, and the little boxes turn around, and they have relics in them. I don't know if you know what relics are. It's kind of an old Catholic thing where they're bones and teeth, which I kind of went ick, but um, didn't do a lot for me. But the story, the, 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 the point of his story was... And I, if you can play the video, Jerry, Jerry uh, and I, we, we left this church after he tells us this story, and it was just very powerful for us. Um, hey, so Jerry, I, tell us what just happened. So we went to see this church. It didn't even look open, but Dad figured it out. And we're walking around looking. It doesn't seem like a very touristy type of church. And I peek around the corner into this room, and there's a guy there, and he takes us back to a special place of worship that had to do with Francis of Assisi. And he's speaking to us, telling us stories in very broken English. Uh, it was very cool. It's a private tour. It was a little private tour. They showed us a bunch of relics from the, from, we don't know what, but. Yeah, the interesting thing, my takeaway would be <laughs> teary eye. that we're all God's projects. And God has a project for each of us. Yeah. All right. So, you know, it was a, it was kind of a unique moment for us because we're like, how did we end up here? What was this? What was this church thing for us? And and it reminded me as I was preparing this uh, uh, sermon on Acts 27 that, that Paul, you know, Paul was God's project. We're God's project. Uh, St. Francis was God's project. That, that we're all in this process of being sanctified, being conformed to Christ's image, and that that happens when we're on mission, when we're doing the project that God's given us. For St. Francis, it was to serve the poor. For Paul, it was to spread the gospel. For Luke and Aristarchus, it was to support Paul. And they are all being changed as they're doing the thing that God has set out for them to do. And so I have two things for you today. Some of you, and I think most of you know Christ, but if you do not know Christ, if you have not chosen to follow him, you know, you were his mission. You were his purpose. You were his project for coming to earth. He died for your sins and for mine because we're all sinners, and he paid that price. If you haven't accepted what he did on the cross, I'd encourage you to make that decision today. If you don't know enough or if you haven't heard enough, I'd encourage you to talk to any of the elders, and I think there are plenty of other people in the room who'd be happy to talk to you. There is ample evidence to believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and what he did on the cross for your sins. But secondly, if you believe in Jesus, if you've chosen to wholly dedicate your life to him, you know, we're real people serving a real God through love and mission. That's our purpose. God has a project, a purpose, a, a mission for each one of us. We're not, we're not on a team where you get to sit on the bench, right? There are no bench warmers on, on God's team. And so he has a purpose for you. And I, I think many of you have, have found that purpose. And, and for those of you who have not, I'd encourage you today, when we start to pray, Lord, what do you have for me? He may not show you your whole life's plan. Paul knew that his purpose was to spread the gospel. He knew part of that was to go to Rome. It happened very differently, I think, than he had probably wanted or planned when it initially occurred to him, I need to go to Rome. He went there as a prisoner. But I think the story, the miracle is bigger because of the way God did it. And sometimes... Those of us who ha feel like we're on God's mission, like we already know we have a purpose, we're doing things, sometimes things don't go quite the way we think they're supposed to go. It's not the way we planned. We knew God had a plan or a mission for us to do. He has a purpose for our life and to, in service to Christ, and, and things aren't going th the way we want them to. Maybe storms come. Things interrupt. Things are delayed. 
And yet God is still with us. His plan is undeterred. God will not be deterred by anything if he has set you on a plan and a mission. But we have to follow his plan. We can't do it our own way. We can't steal the skiff and try and go off and do our own thing. We have to stay the course and do what God has set in ahead of us. And we need to do it with boldness and courage, which I think comes by having the Holy Spirit be in us, by being in communion with God in prayer the way Paul was. He had discernment from life experience. He had, he had a constant in touch with God. And so I'd ask you to bow your heads in prayer, all of those things. And I know some of you, life has been hard, and you're going through a storm right now. And so I'll just pray. Father in heaven, I don't know where each individual is at, but I know that there are people that need you. And I know that you are with us even in this storm. Jesus, we thank you. You died on a cross so that we could be saved and have life abundantly. You give us living water. And, Lord, you made the seas and you calmed the seas. And you take us through even when there's a storm, when you don't calm them. And, God, you are with us through all of it. I pray that for each person here, um, as we're in service to you, as you're changing us, Lord, that we would have our part, that we would have our purpose, our project, our, our mission. We'd be fulfilling the role that you've given us. And when it's delayed or something isn't going quite the way that we think it should, God, I pray that we would stay the course, that we would look to you, not, not to other options, Lord, that we would stay the course and the plan that you put in front of us and trust you because you always have a greater plan for us than we could possibly imagine. And we ask all these things, and for your glory's sake, in Jesus' name. And folks, for any of you who want to pray, and I encourage you,